Hello and welcome to the AI Digest. My name is Joaquin Milara and with me today is Mr. Diego Fung. Diego, how are you doing? Good, Joaquin. How are you? I'm good. I'm ecstatic to have you here. Uh, I love talking to you. This is just a, a bonus. I get to memorialize this conversation. Uh, we've known each other for some time now. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I'm just really happy to have you. Happy to be here. Uh, Mr. Diego Fung, you are an aerospace engineer. And uh, you're currently based out of Michigan. Uh, how's Michigan? Oh, it's great. Uh, it's nice place. Um, there's uh, the weather can get cold in the winter compared to the east coast, but for the most time, for the most part, is it's really good out here. Um, I like it because you know less traffic. Um, there's lots of uh, outdoor activities. And um, yeah, it has an upper peninsula uh, on the north part of the state that's beautiful. There's a lot of um, areas that you can go and visit. And yeah, it's very peaceful. Uh, if you like nat nature, it's something that, you know, it's worth visiting. For sure. There's a there's a lot of cows and dairy products and cheese and yogurt and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, and also um, uh, I learned this the other day blueberries as well. Um, they there are blueberries farms around here too. So yeah, I'm jealous, Diego. You get all the <laughs> blueberry and dairy products. I want to move. <laughs> yeah, you should move here. <laughs> get the couch ready. <laughs> um so Diego for as long as I've known you you've always been in pursuit of uh seeking a career with around inside of airplanes and aerospace and all these things and um yeah you're doing it now so congratulations to you man um thank you can you tell us a little bit about why uh why airplanes and what is uh, sort of the, the, the joy that you get out of working with these dy dynamic uh, vehicles? Yeah, um, I've always liked airplanes, um, commercial, military. Um, I just find it how um, incredible it is that, you know, these machines can uh, transport people or, uh, you know, go travel far places. Uh, if you look at like the last hundred years, um, for instance, um, there is a flight that goes from Singapore to Newark, New Jersey. It takes about 19 hours to complete. A hundred years ago, it would have taken months. Mm. And this is crazy how technology got us, you know, to this point. And, um, I just find it to be, you know, just awesome, exciting, and yeah. And when I, as I said, when I was a kid, I, I always liked airplanes. I Every time I went to the airport, it was exciting for me to see them take off and land. So yeah, this is something I've, I've always wanted to work in, so yeah. I do have to ask, Diego, are you the engineer that's uh, designing the seats to be extra small and uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the period airline seats? <laughs> Which, whichever. whichever like, uh, yeah. Or any ultra low cost carrier. <laughs> Actually, uh, no, but uh, at a previous uh, job, yeah, I used to work for a automotive supplier and they had also a aircraft seating division and um i'm pretty sure they had a contract with spirit to make seats for them <laughs> <laughs> but if i was in charge of that i would have made them like really comfy you know? <laughs> lazy boy right yeah like lazy boy recliners <laughs> in every point <laughs> massage chairs and everything um yeah cool man well um 
maybe in the future we'll only fly like eight people in an airplane, but we'll be super comfortable. So super comfy, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, man, let's let's jump into it. What um, you know, what is some of the stuff that you studied for? And um, let 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 let's take a broad perspective. What is a, a, a system? Where do we begin with a system? Yes, yeah, so um, basically um, a system is any set of objects um, or components that when you interconnect them together, they perform a certain task. So, um, and then, um, you know, this system, it has inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in order for you to uh, control this system, um, you have to have controls that um, basically steer the system into any desired state you want it to be. So take, for example, um, heating system in the house, uh, the goal is to keep the temperature, you know, at a, you know, room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. And the system consists of the furnace, the, if it's central air or could be like a water-based heating, uh, you know, the docks, the pipes used in, to connect the, that, you know, uh, transport the heat around the house. You also mm -hmm. have your thermostat, um, and yeah, so these make part of the system and the goal is to keep the temperature at room temperature. Um, and, um, each of these components is designed, you know, to meet that goal and you have your inputs, you know, which are in this case, the thermostat, you know, the user can set the temperature they desire and then, you know, then the system will respond to that input and then it will, you know, provide an output, which in this case is whatever temperature you set your thermostat to. So, and then you can also have other complex systems such as maneuvering space shuttle. So they come in all, you know, shapes and sizes and depends on what the application is. So that 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 heating uh, that that HVAC temperature regulating system, as you said, it has several components. Um, it has a, a heating element, a cooling element, some way of um, receiving input from the environment that it's trying to regulate, and um, that control, right? The thermostat, where you can say uh, make it to this temperature or make it lower or make it higher. And then the system automatically is supposed to regulate um, to, to, to ensure that it can meet that goal, right? Yeah. But in, in, in the case of a vehicle, it's a bit it's a bit more of a dynamic system, right? Where you're kind of moving within another dynamic environment. Right. Yeah, in the case of a, say an aircraft, or even a vehicle, um, most of the systems out there in the world are non-linear. So what does it mean for a system to be linear and non-linear? So basically it means that uh, when something is linear, um, when you provide an input to the system, you will have a corresponding output uh, associated with that input. Now, if you then apply a second input and it also yields an output, um, you can apply multiple inputs into your system and then the outputs would basically be the sum of the outputs that would correspond to individual inputs being applied separately. So this concept is called a superposition principle mm -hmm. um and you know when a system is in this case linear the output response for a given input 
does not depend on when the input is applied. So, so what but the thing is, um, in the real world, most systems are nonlinear, which means that uh, by definition, uh, it doesn't, the superposition principle that I just explained where applying multiple inputs yield uh, an output, which is the sum as if you apply the inputs by themselves, that doesn't apply. And um, the best example or the most simple example that comes to mind is in control theory, a well-known problem is called the pendulum problem. So basically, if you picture in your mind a ceiling, and then from that ceiling, you have a string that's hanging from the ceiling, and then you have a small weight hanging. Mm -hmm. um, the, in order for one to model the motion of the, the mass at the end of the string, the equation is itself involves uh, a sine function and a sine function in, in this case is uh, nonlinear. So um, in that case, um, when say you pull the mass, right? And you wanna release it from like a certain height or from a certain distance and just let it go, it will oscillate back and forth. Um, in that case, to model this system, you need uh, a nonlinear uh, approach. But if you take the same mass and then only pull it slightly, mm -hmm. as just a small distance, and then you release it, um, because the motion is represented by a sine wave, in this case, um, for small distances, the sine function can be approximated um, as a linear function. So in other words, um, you know, you can take a nonlinear system and then break it down into smaller linear systems. Hmm. Um, okay, so let me take a step back and ask, how do you design a system? What, what are the key considerations when you're looking at uh, linear, nonlinear objectives and things like that? Yes. So to design a system, first you need to identify the different variables that are uh, involved in a specific process. So for example, say you want to toast the bread in in a toaster for three minutes um in this case the input would be setting the time for three minutes and then the output would be uh the toasted bread uh so the act of setting the timer that's your input and then three minutes later you get uh your toast so and also Besides identifying the input, output, and the other variables that go into the system, you also have to um, come up, or if if it's given, you also have to use the specifications. And these are basically just a set of documented requirements that the system has to satisfy. Based on based on whose criteria? Based based on the um, for example, if it's a uh, uh, consumer's, uh, you know, electronic like a cell phone, then you know it has to fulfill certain tasks, right? So you are looking at it from the perspective of the end user. Um, or, for example, for an aircraft engine, um, if you are manufacturing an air uh, turbine blade. The blade has to meet certain dimensional specifications as well as um, material specifications. What if I say no? What if I say, I don't want to go to Staples. I don't want to go to Best Buy. I'm going to make my own toaster and I'm going to pick my own uh, gauge wire 
and I'm going to solder everything and uh, use aluminum foil and uh, duct tape it. Why would that not be uh, uh, acceptable? Well, um, in this case, it sounds like you're trying to um, replicate the function of the toaster, but your end goal is to have, you know, the toast and um, you're just approaching it in a different way. Um, but it could be that uh, you have a, some sort of preference that only applies to you and something that's commercially available out there that would not meet that um, <clears throat> requirement then you know you can come up with then you know your own specification so is there some sort of tangible benefit or intangible benefit for adhering to specifications yes uh for instance in in the aerospace world uh you have to it's heavily regulated um you have the faa and other entities that are involved um in those instances yeah you there are they there are many specifications uh, that you have to follow but then in other instances um you know sometimes you don't have to follow all those specifications so it really depends on what the end goal is I see. for your system so a prototype wouldn't necessarily be um held to the same standard as something that is a commercial vehicle that has the potential to impact thousands of people, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so apart from specifications, um, I imagine for a system to accomplish something, like we talked about the example with uh, HVAC, uh, heating elements and cooling elements, um, you're not going to design everything from scratch, are you? I mean, I'm sure you can, but um, to create something that you can commercially build by going to Home Depot or whatever, I, I would think that you'd want, want to buy or, or use existing parts, no? Yes. Uh, it really depends on what, the, what you're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, <clears throat> for example, um, if you wanted to build a prototype to as a, to to use it as a proof of concept, then yeah, you can use, um, you know, what's commercially available out there. Like you said, going to Home Depot or or going to the store and buying some parts and putting things together. But then there are instances when those components that are commercially available, you know, they may not uh, help you achieve the goal of the system. So then you will have to design your own and um you know and as you know when you're first developing a system um as a prototype the first iteration of your component you know will not be your final it's just just to show that um whatever task or service you're trying to accomplish accomplish is doable so it's yeah a concept, right yeah there for the most part you know um in engineering and other fields, you know, you um, you don't try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you are not trying to go from zero to one every time you are working on something. Um, it's mostly iterations of what already exists out there because to go from zero to one is, is very difficult. And time consuming and resource uh, con consuming, I imagine. Yes. Okay, um, so how do you go and design these components uh, and then decide whether to buy or build? Yes. So I think the best way to look at this uh, would be to run an example. So before jumping into the specifics, um, once you identify what the system has to accomplish and um, what the inputs and the outputs are and also the variables. Um, what you then do is um, 
you create a, a model, which is basically a precise representation of a system used to answer questions via analysis and simulation. Hmm. And uh, the model that you choose depends um, you know, on the question you wish to answer. So what I mean by that is um, you have to um, come up with a mat mathematical representation of a system uh, because this will then allow you to make predictions of how the system will behave. And one way of modeling a system in math is through the use of a something called state space form and basically state space form is a way of um, building a model that then describes your system um, and this is important because once you identify the input output and then with the state space form you'll be able to see the other variables that go into the system um, and um, state space basically uh tells you that the state of a dynamical system is a collection of variables that characterizes the motion of a system completely for the purpose of predicting future motion so take for example um the solar system you have a system of planets that are in motion um you can develop this math mathematical model to describe their motion. Now, um, once you have your model, then in order to choose the components that you need, uh, what you then do is come up with a, a plan, a map that shows how the pieces come together. Uh, you have to uh, identify them uh, in a diagram with, you know, you can use boxes and then uh, sort of like a flow chart that, you know, on one end you have your inputs, then um, it goes through a process and then it spits out an output at the end. Um, and then from there, uh, you then get into the specifics and then you have to for example, looking into uh, the inputs, uh, you have to determine, okay, what exactly uh, am I uh, trying to accomplish here? So going back to the example of the heating system, um, basically you're trying to tell the system when to turn itself on and off. So, in this case, you know, you need some sort of knob uh, and also a temperature gauge where you can set the temperature. Uh, and then from there, um, once you have that, then you have to have the other part of the system, which is the furnace. Um, and um, if you look into the furnace, um, the, the function of a furnace is governed by a thermodynamic cycle. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're basically taking energy uh and converting it into another form of energy so um once you have everything laid out of how you're going to accomplish this you then get into the specifics okay um if you have a, a radiator based heating you're taking water which you are then heating up and then that water travels through the pipes reaches the radiator it then uh, heats the surrounding through convection and radiation. And then the water flows back into the furnace where the cycle began. And then you repeat that cycle until you reach, you know, your desired temperature. So Damn. once you, <laughs> once uh, you determine all the tasks you need to do, you then, you know, lay you come up with a plan how you're going to accomplish that and you know break it you have to then break it into specific uh small tasks you know you take the big problem and break it down into smaller problems and then from there determine okay how am i going to accomplish 
this smaller task, which when I put everything together will help me accomplish my goal. Are so. you telling me that everything that surrounds us was constructed by people and that they took painstaking amounts of effort to think of prototype test, refine and mass produce all these products? Yeah. You trying to tell me that? Yeah, it's I don't believe same, it. I mean, think you look at uh, like look at a at your at a currencies, right? Like when before I worked for that company, uh, I never paid attention, you know, to seeds and stuff like that. I mean, what the seed is, you know, for you to Pick get down in the vehicle and drive. But if you look into how much work goes into this, yeah, you'll be amazed. It's uh it's involved and um it also boils down to you know like uh safety and you know protecting the lives of others too so it like i said you know it always starts at the top level of what you're trying to accomplish and and from there you also you know have to consider safety and all those things so i'm just i'm just kidding uh but i am thoroughly um i am thoroughly blown away at the clarity of how you explain the priorities of concern right a system has a objective that objective can be accomplished many different ways but uh you sort of want to constrain that objective through here are the resources here is the space here is the time here are the laws of physics the laws of nature and um, here's what can be achieved in this timeline. So um, I think that, that that model concept is especially useful for people to, you know, even if they're not from an engineering background, if, if they're trying to design anything, whether it's a business or a toaster or anything, really, having inputs and outputs is only part of the equation, right? Yeah modeling the intended behavior or function of that system is another component. Yeah. And, um, and that's where, you know, um, like I mentioned, most things out there in real, in the real world are nonlinear and, uh, it, it gets involved and then, but you know, you can always break them down into smaller linear systems and then solve them. So, so let's that's the approach, you know, how control theory works. It basically uses this approach of having, um, you know, modeling, using mathematical models, you mm -hmm. know, to uh, describe the system, which can then help you predict future states. So let's talk about quality control, because uh, before we even get to, to um, controls at large, um, what is what is quality? So quality um, means meeting a set of specifications uh, and ensuring that the product or system uh, meets those specifications. So in my current role, um, I work in quality and also product engineering and um in the world of aerospace uh quality is equivalent to safety um as you know these airplanes uh they fly at high altitudes where you cannot afford to have errors in the systems or details you know that can then bite you later on and uh from an aerospace standpoint, quality means ensuring that um, the system meets its intended goal, uh, its goal and that um, the components that are part of the system are designed from a from a standpoint of safety. So, so the the intended um, the intended function of an airplane is to land without crashing, right? Right um okay so as long as uh that system meets acceptable standards fuel consumption ergonomics safety 
um, electricity, propulsions, etc. Uh, if it meets or exceeds uh, regulatory requirements, it it has the standard of quality met, right? That's right. Um, and if you exceed that, then then you have superior quality. But that that quality is sort of a relative measure against the goal and other competitors and industry standards. Is that is that correct? Correct. Yeah, right. and there are many industry standards out there, um, and aerospace has its own set of standards that are more strict, you know. Right, rightfully so. The, the closer you are to human life, yeah, the more delicate you have to traverse that uh, terrain. Um, so let's talk about control theory. I know that's uh, one of the key, uh, key components of this conversation. And uh, we sort of went over high level as to what is a system, what are inputs, what are outputs, what are functions. But um, as you said, uh, most systems are nonlinear. And uh, if you want to operate a system like a vehicle or a tool, uh, it's also introduces a level of dynamic elements, right? Correct. So wh where can we get that conversation started? What where do we pick up that that idea? So now that we know we you know that we live in a non-linear world, how do we come up with ways, you know, to control this chaos and then produce something tangible and useful? That's where control theory comes into place and it's a very broad field. Uh, People do PhDs on control theory, and it's constantly evolving. Um, but in a nutshell, basically, control theory deals with the control of dynamic dynamical systems in engineering and science. And the goal is to develop a model um, that governs the application of the system uh, of its inputs to drive the system to a desired state while minimizing any delay that could occur or an overshoot or an error, and also ensuring there is a stability in the system. Um, and to do this, um, what the, uh, to steer the system into a desired state, uh, you use algorithms uh, and feedback um, to help you get there. So for example, um, if you look at the, uh, into the history of control, um, it dates back into like the 19th century roughly. Um, and it started, uh, <clears throat> really back when Newton was working on the motion of, of planets. And then later on in like the 19th century, uh, when uh, in electrical engineering, uh, for example, you, uh, James Maxwell, uh, he also contributed to this field uh, without him knowing at that time when he worked on uh, equations that uh, describe uh, electricity and magnetism so and uh and once <clears throat> uh you know you have uh, a system uh in order to control this system um you have your inputs and outputs <clears throat> and other variables um the system that you're trying to control um can be either linear or non-linear and for you to control uh, your system, uh, you can have external influences or or not or any influences at all. So, for example, if you think of planets, um, these uh, bodies of mass are so large. Uh, when you try to model them. Um, you can assume that you know they can be treated as being independent uh, objects that uh, you there is no external influence that could disrupt their motion 
Mm -hmm. um, but if you think of, for example, another model such as a uh, an aircraft that's flying a cruising altitude and then it's hit by a uh, lightning bolt and then the wing will or the whole aircraft will react to that input and then it will try to stabilize itself so it you now have a system that can be influenced from external factors or you could have systems that are you know external factors can be you know considered negligible so and uh the ones you know that are considered negligible those are called uh autonomous systems uh they call them white box systems and then the ones that use external factors that are influenced by those those are called in control theory black black box systems hmm. and then yeah that's basically you know what control theory deals with so what, how, do you, how do you control this, the dynamical system to achieve you know your goals so what determines um whether it's a white or a black box system is whether it's uh so regulated against the broader environment right yep so um in the instance that you gave a lightning bolt uh, a li lightning bolt strikes an airplane mid-flight um and it disrupts the intended function of the airplane it self-regulates that is a white box because it's just looking to achieve its purpose without any additional factors to consider is that what you're saying what well, right well in this case uh when the plane is subjected to this external force um storms or, or storm or it's now um now your model um in order to describe it um it's influenced by the input which in this case could be the weather and the lighting bulb um but uh you can also look at it from the other standpoint that white box uh approach <clears throat> in that the plane you know uh, after this external factor is applied it tries to correct itself to you know go back to uh its steady state condition you know before it was subjected to the uh weather and external factor okay but the point is that the white white box systems have some sort of explanation as to what how, how they behave and why they behave right mm -hmm. yeah as opposed to black box when there's multiple factors involved that don't make it necessarily clear how or why a system is behaving the way it behaves, right? Right, yep. The why, basically, yep. Why box tells you, yeah, this system, um, the whole system itself um, is, there's an absence of, you know, external factors that influence its motion and therefore, you know, it, how you predict it. But with the black, black box, uh, systems you now have to consider those external factors and how they can impact the system so so we look at a system uh we look at the inputs we look at the outputs but in, internally there are variables and those variables hold a state right yep and uh those states might be positive or negative um they each each of those states would would hold those values, right? Good things and bad things can happen to yep. any part of a system, right? That's right. And basically, what the, the, these variables do, um, um, they are called state variables. Uh, they evolve over time in a way that depends on the values they have at any given instant, and on also. Uh, on the externally imposed values of the input variables. Um, output variables, uh, they depend on the values of the state variables. And um, then in that, from that sense, the state of a dynamical system is 
a collection of variables that characterizes the motion of the system completely for the purpose of predicting future motion. So, for example, for the system of planets, right, uh, the state is simply the position and velocities of the planets. And we call the set of all possible states the state space. So at any given time, you could have a planet in a certain position, it will have a location and it's in motion, it will have a velocity. So, but as you know, in the solar system, planets go around the sun, um, you have many states that the planet can be in. So we call all these possible states, the state space. And the system, just like a planet can have different positions and velocities, has the same thing. In this case, um, going back to the airplane example, you know, you can have the plane uh, taking off. Uh, you, that's, you know, in a specific state, then you can have the plane cruising uh, at a certain altitude. It will have a, a position, a speed, a height. So, and what do, all those possible states that the airplane can be in, you call the you call that the state space, and what this mathematical model does is um, basically represent all these states uh, using formulas, which can then help you predict, you know, with any with any input when at any given input uh, and state, what's the output, you know, for the system. So we're how do we begin by evaluating an environment and sort of charting to see whether we are in a um, linear, nonlinear, static or dynamic environment? And how do we model that in, in, a, in a mathematical formula? Where do we begin? So you first begin um, most engineering problems. Um, you have to look at the physics of the problem itself. So for example, um, let's talk about an aircraft engine. Um, the whole aircraft, the, the whole cycle, it's controlled by a thermodynamic cycle called the Brayton cycle. Uh, it was, this cycle was developed by a British uh, engineer back in the early 1900s. So in this cycle, basically you are converting energy from one form into another. So the way an aircraft engine works is, um, well, as you know, in this case, the engine is a system. The goal of this system is to uh, provide thrust for the airplane so that it can move forward. Now, how do you achieve that goal? Um, that's where the Rayton cycle comes into play. And it explains how, um, the system produces that force. And the way that happens is um, an aircraft engine is divided into four uh, subsystems. You have the compressor that's at the front of the engine. Uh, and the goal of this subsystem is to take the outside air and raise its pressure and temperature to a specific state, which then you take that air at that given state and send it to the combustion chamber where the chemical reactions take place and where the actual uh, energy conversion takes place. You have fuel coming in and you mix that fuel with the compressed air from the compressor, mm -hmm. which then generates a uh, exothermic reaction that releases heat and then you take this heat and then run it through a turbine and a turbine the goal of the turbine which we're now talking about the other um, subsystem its goal is to extract the energy from the hot gases coming out of the combustion chamber which you know also has its own goal in that case which is uh combine the air and the fuel to create the hot gas 
Um, once the turbine section of the aircraft engine sees the hot air, it then extracts that energy and converts that energy into mechanical energy that makes the turbine uh, blades spin, which then drives the compressor up front of the engine. And then the fourth system is the uh, no nozzle of the engine, which its function is to um, take that air from the turbine and then uh, eject it uh, in the opposite direction that the airplane is traveling. So if you picture, you know, an airplane flying in the air, moving forward, the the air or the that pass the turbine, those are moving in the opposite direction. And sort of like a balloon, you know, if you inflate a balloon and you let go, uh, once you inflate it, the balloon uh, will try to fly uh, and then the air will be expelled in the opposite direction. So this is, you know, the system in a nutshell for, for an aircraft engine. You take the air, you compress it, you then mix it with the fuel to create a hot gas, which then you pass it through the turbine and then the turbine extracts that energy from the hot gas, which then converts it into mechanical energy. Uh, and that drives the compressor and then the cycle repeats again. So it's a four, uh, it's in four stages. And um, as you can see each stage um, completes a specific task, which when you take them all together as part of the system, you know, it it creates the thrust required to propel the aircraft forward. Now, um, to talk about engines more specifically, um, as far as how to control each of these subsystems, um, Initially, these engine configurations were simple. As I explained, you have the compressor, combustor, the turbine, and the exhaust nozzle. Um, the first control systems for these engines were hydromechanical and used um, the principle of the flyball governor extensively for you know, speed control. And that's the topic of a separate discussion. Basically, what what I'm trying to say here is initially when these aircraft engines, uh, jet engines were first designed, um, they use hydromechanics, you know, to control the various systems. But now everything nowadays uh, is digital and computer-based control. And uh, that's how you can control, you know, your flow of fuel to the combustor, or you can control the speed at which the turbine blade rotates. So, um, it, it has evolved a lot from like the early 1900s to what it is today. Um, and now with the current technology, um, not only aircraft engines are more efficient, but also you can um, use this system, the aircraft engine, in multiple scenarios where you can have external factors act on it and you and the system still is able to, you know, produce the thrust uh, for the airplane. So I think it's, um, I think it's certainly interesting in how you're kind of breaking this, uh, the, the, the functional model of how the system performs uh, into these uh, individual actions, right? I think that's sort of what you were talking about earlier, that if you look at yeah. any kind of complex system, if you were to break it down into its constituent parts and look at pass or fail reactions, it gives you a false sense of um, linear, li uh, many linear systems, right? Either it does it or it doesn't. Either it doesn't right. or it doesn't. Does it pass the function or did it fail to meet that expectation? And if so, what is the impact in the larger system? Um, and, and, if, and if there's a failure, does it self-regulate? Or can it uh, find a way to have a safety protocol or some sort of safety mechanism? Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, and also for an aircraft engine, um, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, it's a nonlinear, multi-variable, and also multi-input, multi-output system. It's, it's a very complex system. Uh, and you have to, you have several different control tasks that have to be accomplished simultaneously. So, um, so for example, at looking at the fuel control, um, the fuel has to be injected at a certain rate. Um, you also have to ensure that the uh, fuel doesn't freeze at high altitudes uh, and uh, the temperature where the combustion occurs um, that has to be uh, at a specific level. And then once that reaction occurs, once it leaves the combustion and goes into the turbine, um, you have to ensure that you're not ha having any losses, you know? So it, it's, it's, uh, it's very involved, but despite that, you know, from a control theory standpoint, what you do is, again, you come up with a model to describe this system. In this case, we're talking about the subsystem of the combustion chamber. So. Hmm. And uh, for nonlinear systems such as these, um, it depends on the application. Uh, you can, when you have external factors, um, once the system is operating at its design condition, which is in this case to produce thrust, um, how does the system react to an external factor such as you could have uh, rain, turbulence, or even uh, a bird strike, you know, say an airplane taking off from the runway. Uh, what if a bird accidentally goes into it? Um, mm. The system then is designed in a way that uh, it returns to its design state, which is to produce thrust. Uh, and, you know, there could be cases where that's not achievable, but the system is designed in such a way that it can always go back to its steady state. Diego, you've, you've certainly given me a, a lot to think about conceptually. Um, this conversation, every word just makes me want to go diagram um, the functionality of these things that, that we've been discussing here. Um, if you were to give one piece of advice on how to take an overarching goal and decompose it into sub goals or things that are manageable, uh, man ma manageable chunks or manageable mini projects. How would you go about with that exercise? Yes. So breaking down a big problem, you know, into a smaller problems um it's useful because you know it then helps you achieve you know uh, what the intended goal is of the system but uh, from my experience um what i've seen is uh, to break it you know into manageable sizes is well first of all you have to um you have to start with the requirements, the the, the main goal, right? Uh, you have to know, okay, um, for example, it, if it's a product, you have to at first identify the problem, what you're trying to solve or do uh, before you start trying to solve anything. And that, you know, begins with questions such as, okay, what feature does this product need to have? what will the components be um, and um, what is the most basic version of this that you know we can make the first time and then from there we can iterate so first you start identifying you know the problem or the task you're trying to accomplish then uh, once you know what that is you then um, have to um, divide divide it into uh, subsections. So, for example, um, 
in the case I gave of the aircraft engine, you have the top goal of producing thrust for the aircraft. You then have to think about, okay, how do I produce this uh, force, right? Um, and that's where um, modeling comes into place and also physics. Um, at a, for any given problem that you're dealing with, you have to, you know, if it's in engineering and science, you have to look at the governing laws that apply to that particular problem. So this being a um, uh, problem related to motion of an object, uh, you have to consider um, the uh, thermodynamics of the system and also the the physics that go into the motion of an aircraft. Um, so once you have that, you now have your uh, subsystems. Your you know you are now divided into smaller problems, uh, and then as I said, you know um, you then have uh, in the case of the aircraft engine, you have a compressor which compresses the air. You then take the air and then mix it with fuel that creates a chemical reaction that then releases heat. You take the heat and then use it to uh, spin the turbine and then it then ejects the hot air through the nozzle. So, um, and then once you have, you know, your sub problems or your sub systems identified, you then have to focus on each of them. But all of them have to do a specific task and then when you put all of them together all those tasks together they achieve you know the main goal so it's basically uh you know you, you start by figuring out what the requirements are um you know what you need to accomplish you then look into the physics uh and also you come up with a model of how you're gonna uh control the system you then make a plan you sit down okay this is what needs to get done um you you divide it you know you just look at the bigger picture but then come up with a plan okay how am i gonna accomplish you know the big picture and then you know you divide and, and conquer and uh that's how you make it manageable damn diego you just gave us some gold um conceptually i mean you could apply this to anything to anything yeah it could be applied to anything um, airplane airplane uh engines to uh dairy factories uh, cheese factories for you cheese lovers out there um let me ask you this diego who should reach out to you and for what oh um yeah anyone who has an interest uh, in aerospace um commercial uh, aviation um, aircraft engines i'm happy to discuss that with them um, and also, you know, anyone who's in control theory, it would be nice to, uh, you know, uh, talk to them as well and, uh, learn more about, you know, what they're, um, uh, what they're working on and how that could be applied into, uh, into the aircraft engine industry. Because as I said, it's, uh, control theory is a field that's constantly, uh evolving and there's lots of research that go into it and um yeah uh, or anyone you know for that matter who likes air airplanes engineering and science yeah well diego I, i've certainly learned a lot and as i said before i will um certainly try to diagram um the differences between these uh, mechanisms I don't think that anybody um, can fully exhaust the benefit of learning how these systems work because system thinking is what allows you to build better businesses, build better uh, software programs, data infrastructure. It just gives you a more holistic view um, around objectives and behavior i mean ultimately we all want to achieve something and i think when people just focus on the subsystems and not the greater overarching goal uh we lose sight of what's important right it's not about the tools 
it's not about oh uh, aluminum sucks steel's steel's the best or steel sucks aluminum is the best it's about what is fit for use what is economic to use uh what you know do, do we want to do a custom build engine or do we want to do a a a scale up of a thousand engines um and what are the parameters that we have to work with an economic regulatory um physical right physics wise uh production wise quality assurance wise maintenance wise there's so many factors to consider um but yeah man i i I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and uh giving us a bit of a schooling no and uh i want to say thank you for having me it was great talking with you and yeah it was 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 fun thanks for having me again joaquin I'm warning you, Diego. I'm, I'm gonna come crash on your couch and eat eat all the blueberries <laughs> and drink all the milk and cheese. So you're welcome anytime, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right.